So I didn't really want to do my hair, and this is the only hat that I have. It was uh, for a Guy Fawkes costume. Um, so, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> uh, the book I want to read from uh, right now is Rural Women Battering in the Justice System in Ethnography by Neil Websdale. So, Rural Women Battering in the Justice System presents a thorough and arresting look at the experiences of battered women in rural communities. While living in rural areas of Kentucky, Neil Websdale conducted his ethnographic research and he situated the voices of rural battered women at the center of his ethnography. He clearly demonstrates how rural patriarchy and the insidious good old boy network of law enforcement and local politics sustains and continues to reproduce the subordinate, vulnerable, isolated position of many rural women. Taking into account that traditional patterns of intervention can often put women in isolated communities at further risk, the author recommends a coordinated multi-agency approach to rural battering that is spearheaded by state feminist agencies. Illuminating and accessible rural women battering in the justice system makes a most important and timely contribution to this field. So, Rural Women Battering in the Justice System by Neil Websdale. It's copyright 1998, so it's uh, 14 years old, so fairly, fairly uh, recent. 98, so th this is this is how things were in the 90s. Okay, introduction. Over the past decade or so, policymakers have increasingly come to realize the epidemic proportions of violence against women in the home. It is easy to see how one of the alternative pop, pop folk, rock icons of the past 30 years. Leonard Cohen, in his song Democracy, can wax lyrical about the homicidal bitching that occurs in the kitchens of family homes over who will serve and who will eat. Put simply, intimate gender relations in the United States are a lightning rod for assault and homicide. Likewise, these relationships are also marked by enormous psychological tension and antagonism, regardless of whether such hostilities manifest themselves as physical violence. At the same time, many families are the sites of love, intimacy of all kinds, and support for constituent members. These observations are not new. The research literature on violence between intimates is massive and it continues to grow. My purpose in writing this book is to draw attention to a phenomenon that has scant research attention, namely rural women battering and the so-called justice system's response to that violence. One of the reasons for the neglect of women battering in rural communities is that researchers have ignored rural communities. There may be any number of explanations for this neglect. It is not easy for researchers to study rural communities. Rural citizens tend to be suspicious of outsiders in general. Even conducting research through techniques such as telephone surveying is more problematic in rural communities because telephone subscription rates can be much lower than they are in cities. Another reason for the death of research into rural domestic violence may be the popular tendency to see rural communities as more tranquil than urban ones. This image of tranquility is not mythical, rather it is supported by crime statistics that show much lower levels of violent crimes such as robbery and aggravated assault in rural regions. However, as research reveals, violence within families does not follow the same social patterns as street violence. As I go on to show, rural families seem just as prone to outbreaks of violence against women as their urban counterparts. Take for example the following murder-suicide that occurred in rural eastern Kentucky. Myrtle, Myrtle Whitaker survived her husband's attempt to murder her. Myrtle had been victimized for many years by her husband, Alan Whitaker Jr. Prior to the abusive episode on December 15, 1990, when Alan Jr. tried to murder Myrtle and successfully murdered two of his sons and then killed himself. So, uh, attempted to kill her, but didn't kill her, but did kill his two sons and then he killed himself. This is Alan Whitaker Jr. Okay, so the couple started dating when he was 18 and she was 16. Myrtle noted that in the early days of their dating, he was good to me, according to Lexington Herald Leader, March 27, 1991. They married on June 21, 1973, and Myrtle reported the next day he changed. He was my boss, and I had to do what he said, Lexington Herald Leader, March 27, 1991. In 1981, she left him to live with her parents in a small town in Punchian Camp Hollow in eastern Kentucky. He arrived at her parents' house a few days later and ordered his wife and children into his truck at gunpoint. As the family left, Alan held a gun to Myrtle's head. 
Fearing for her life, she told her parents not to call the Magafin County Sheriff. So Magafin, Magafin County, which is named after Bariah Magafin, the uh, uh, Confederate governor during the Civil War in uh, uh, Kentucky, who said that he would not supply any soldiers for Lincoln's cause to subdue uh, the Kentucky's sister states, sister southern states. Then he took a list around the southern states at six compromising points five of them had to deal with slavery uh, so for those folks who want to say that the civil war had nothing to do with slavery our governor and uh, Bariah Magafin uh, Kentucky's governor at the time who's also the person that Magafin County is named after Magafin or McGoffin McGoffin Magafin I don't know but uh, that's uh, uh I don't know. It, it just shows to me that if it's named, that county is named after a Confederate, uh, it just makes me what kind of folks are actually in uh, that county. You also got Jackson County, which is named after Andrew Jackson, and he was a genocidal trail of tears maniac, uh, was against the slaves, and um, was was racist. So he's not. Uh, why we have him on, honor him on the twenty dollar bill? I never have any idea. So. So uh, one day he was good to her, and then the next day he changed. He became her boss and just wanted to dictate her life. In 1981, she left him to live with her parents in a small house in Punchian Camp Hollow in eastern Kentucky. He arrived at her parents' house a few days later and ordered his wife and children into his truck at gunpoint. As the family left, Allen held a gun to Myrtle's head. Fearing for her life, she told her parents not to call the Magafin County Sheriff. Allen Jr. continued to abuse his wife and children over the years. So the parents saw this man take his wife and kids back by gunpoint and didn't call the sheriff or anybody about it or do anything about it. Uh, the family, Allen Jr. and Myrtle Whitaker's family, lived in a remote hollow known as Bear Branch. Their house, like other houses in the hollow, had no running water and no indoor toilet. So, which is in, in the new, nearest road was a mile away. So she's by herself. She's got no running water, no indoor toilet. So they're having to go to an outhouse out back. They, I guess, have to get water from the creek or from the uh, get a tank from from the city and bring it back into the cistern water or a spring. Maybe maybe they had a spring or a well. So they they have different problems than what most other people would have to. Uh, endure such as Letcher County. 60% of Letcher Countyans do not have running water. Allen Jr. had a job as a Magafin County school bus driver and Myrtle received $614 a month in disability and welfare payments. He controlled his family tightly. According to Myrtle's mother, Susan Prater, he didn't allow them to talk to nobody, just whoever he wanted them to speak to. He wouldn't let her visit nobody, Lexington Herald the leader. December 30, 1990. Page A10. Arby Bubby Sublet, whose sister married into the Prather family, commented that he kept them up in a hollow like cattle. Myrtle was ensnared in a network of deeply conflictual family, family relationships, ambushed by her poverty, and able, unable to break free in a community that was home to both her own and her abuser's parents and friends. At one point, Myrtle, Myrtle told her sister, Normal Cole, I ain't got no place to go, no place to stay, no place, no way to make it. So it was a hopeless. She was isolated and she was in a hopeless situation. In spite of her desperate situation, Myrtle planned her escape. On January 19, 1990, she waited until Allen Jr. passed out drunk and then took her two sons and her daughter with her to walk to the mouth of the hollow to use a neighbor's telephone. She called her father, who collected her and the children, and subsequently arranged a secret meeting with local police. As a result of this meeting, Allen Jr. was charged with sodomizing his daughter. He was later re released on bail. Myrtle moved out to the spouse abuse shelter in the area and then into his sister's house. She obtained a restraining order from the court to limit Allen Jr.'s access to her and her children and began to live a new life. This new life including divorcing Allen Jr. The divorce was due to be finalized within a work a week or so after the murder-suicide. So the divorce never actually went through. Um, and he killed himself before the divorce was able to go through. On the day of the murder-suicide, Allen Jr. and Myrtle met so that he could take the youngest son to stay with him overnight. Their oldest son, Kermit, reached for some food to hand to his father. Allen Jr. took the food and put it on the hood of Myrtle's car. He then told Myrtle and the kids that he had a better idea than eating food and started firing his thirty-eight caliber revolver at, at his family. 
He killed the two boys and he left Myrtle for dead. His daughter escaped. He then reloaded the revolver and shot himself in the head. So uh, let's, let's, let's read that again to see the exact circumstances. So on the day of the murder suicide, Alan Jr. and Myrtle met so that he could take the youngest son to stay with him overnight. So he was coming up to pick the youngest son to stay with him. The oldest son, Kermit, reached for some food to hand to his father. Alan Jr. took the food and he put it on the hood of Myrtle's car. Then he then told Myrtle and the kids that he had a better idea than eating food and started firing his 38 caliber revolver at his family. So, so the oldest said, here's some food, Daddy. And then Daddy said, well, I don't want your damn food. And bam, bam, now you kids are dead. Now you kids are dead. And uh, I guess he shot Myrtle, but she didn't die. And the daughter ran away. And then he reloaded the revolver and he shot himself in the head. So events such as the Murderker, the Whitaker murder suicide sent shockwaves through small Kentucky towns. These shockwaves are often amplified through the urban presses in Louisville and Lexington. One of the discursive themes of these shockwaves is the disturbance of the apparent rural idyll. These rural atrocity tales cast an ominous shadow over a way of life that is locally governed, that shuns outsiders, in which people's families and friends are ultimately intimately interconnected over generations. However, it is not my point that violence against women in rural communities takes different physical forms from that in urban areas. This book is not an attempt to provide hard quantitative data on the prevalence of battering in rural VOV urban areas. Rather, the book is a study of interpersonal violence against women within a number of intersecting contexts, one of them being the rural sociocultural milieu or milieu. Rural phenomenon are not easy to study using quantitative data sources such as police call data and arrest reports, court convictions, and the like. My use of ethnographic methods, including 96 focused interviews and participant and non-participant observation, is designed to overcome these difficulties. Um, so more, uh, just as my sense of wonderment at cultural life in rural Kentucky may have been partially influenced by my childhood as a working-class Briton, so too must my curiosity about rural women battering having been partially shaped by a personal inexperience with such matters, not having grown up in a battering family, and not having been a batterer, I cannot speak from the unassailable pulpit of experience on these matters. Indeed, as one of my colleagues recently suggested, I may have been be better able to write about bat battering than I had been, than had I been the perpetrator of such violence, at least at some point during my life. So, well, yeah, that's a couple... That's a little bit of an introduction um, to talk a little bit about it. The rural women battering, it's its a problem here in Kentucky. And actually, Kentucky has got, we're number one state for animal abuse, number one state for child abuse and child death, uh, or child, child, child deaths and child abuse cases. So out of all the uh, cases of abuse, Kentucky is number one for killing the children that are in abuse cases. Uh, there's also elder abuse, domestic violence, and uh, there's also police violence, too. Violence very much pervades the Kentucky culture. Um, and, and the fact that we're number one for all these things is just absolutely incredible. There's been several things that actually happened in uh, close to Gallatin County or in Gallatin County themselves. Uh, my uncle had bought a farm off uh, 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 this one guy who... I guess went ape shit and shot his kid and shot his wife and shot himself. So another murder suicide where they killed the entire families. Um, Gallatin County is also the place of Marco Chapman, which is the last Kentuckian that was executed in the state of Kentucky. So Marco Chapman was, um, I'm not sure exactly the circumstances, but he was uh, uh, dating a woman and he uh, maybe wasn't getting enough attention or something and went back and shot the children. Um, and then ran away. So, and my old man tried to murder me too. So there's uh, the the fact that we're not protecting our children. We also have a real low uh, or high child mortality rate, depending on how you look at that. Um, but the child mortality rate is how you define a civilization. Whether or not you're able to raise your children is whether or not a civilization can be. Uh, sustained and it can go on and if you're not able to protect your wife and kids frankly as a man that's the only thing I got to do like I mean a lot of people say they, I remember the old man that tried to kill me a handkerchief if you carried a handkerchief then you're a real man that has nothing to do with a man whether you're a handkerchief um, whether you can lift you know 200 pounds those things 
they they somewhat matter but they they're not the core thing the main thing about being a man is taking care of your wife and children and if you're taking care of your wife and your kids then everything else is just what a man does I don't have to try to be a man I just have to try to be a good man not to be a great man just be a good man and a good man to me is take care of my wife and kids and that's it as long as I'm doing that I'm doing what a man's supposed to do but where I came from these were not values that were respected in the community.